So uh, the uh, data visualization for analytics is a great topic. And uh, so um, if you attend the last two years uh, Spark Summit, you probably see Jeremy's talk. So uh, about a month, roughly a month, a month and a half ago, I saw his presentation at Databricks about using uh, Spark visualization, the new frame framework, and he's going to talk about to see. I'm just totally blown away. I said, you know, I need to invite him to give our memberships, uh, to give another talk, just see more people to see his great work. So uh, Jeremy is, is uh, you know, leader researcher uh, at uh, the... Uh, this is a research lab. I couldn't pronounce it. Uh, Genelia, it's called. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you, you probably see his names if you're on the Spark mailing list. You probably see him. He's very active there. And uh, he's also very active in this new uh, open source framework called Lightning. So uh, with that, you know, I, you know, you know, hopefully you're blown away as I, I, I did. <laughs> so here, bear me. Great. Oh, you don't need I that. think I don't need that. OK, all right. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Chester, for having me. Uh, it's a real honor to come out, uh, and I really appreciate uh, the invitation. And I'm excited to, yeah, talk to you guys about the stuff we're doing, um, share with you some things. I want this to be to be interactive, so definitely interrupt me if I say things that don't make sense or that you disagree with, um, or if you want to get an argument, that's great. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll try to make this uh, make this lively. There's uh, it's a talk, but in the middle I'm going to do some demos. So I'll, the, the thing itself will be interactive. Um, and yeah, let's get started. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I am a, a researcher. I run a group uh, at the Genelia Research Campus, which is a, a very interesting, uh, ne basically, neuroscience research institute uh, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's in northern Virginia, which probably not a lot of people have been to, um, in a town called Ashburn. So it's this giant, sort of futuristic looking research center nestled away in, the, in sort of the forest built on a previous farmland. Uh, and we do a lot of really exciting uh, neuroscience work there. So I'm not properly a developer, I'm a neuroscientist, and I'm interested in understanding how the brain works. Um, but something that, oh, does this work? Oh, I need to like plug it in, I guess. Uh, I can just do that. Great. All right, let's go old school. Um, yeah, so I'm a neuroscientist, but I'm also very interested in computation. Um, and I'm also interested in the ways that we can use new computational tools to understand the kind of data that we're generating in neuroscience. Right now, I think it's a very exciting time both for computation and the kinds of technologies that are being developed to understand the data and to mine data, but also it's a very exciting time in terms of what we can measure and what we can learn about the brain. So I've been, uh, it's really been exciting to be at the intersection between these two things, and that theme is really going to be what this, what this talk is about. So I'm first going to say a little bit, just to give you a sense of, on this side, the left, the sort of experimental side, the kinds of things we can do in neuroscience right now, because it's really radically changed, even over the last five years, the last 10 years since I've been doing neuroscience, it's radically changed. Uh, and right now is a really, a really exciting moment. So the first thing that's pretty remarkable right now is that there are new technologies that make it possible to monitor activity uh, of neurons in a brain uh, in a couple different species at fairly high temporal resolution and extremely high spatial resolution. So the first example I'm going to show uh, are experiments that we can do in the larval zebrafish, which is probably not an animal that many of you are familiar with. Um, they're really hard to see by the naked eye. They're really tiny. Um, they have this cool property, which is that they're transparent, which means technologies we use for monitoring neural activity uh, allow us to see basically the entire brain. Um, and these particular experiments are done in the collaboration, uh, collaboration with a fantastic group at Genelia, Misha Ahrens in his lab, as well as Philip Keller, who have built a lot of technology for doing these experiments and making these measurements. So this is a method called light sheet imaging, which makes it possible to, in a video I'll show you in a second, monitor neural activity across basically all of the zebrafish brain at uh, a single neuron resolution. And we can do this while simultaneously engaging the animals in fairly simple behaviors. Um, so for example, you can present a stimulus, a pattern, like this movement pattern below the fish that he's going to look at, and he'll actually try to swim in response to this. Now he's actually paralyzed, which is important to keep him still, but he tries to swim in response, and we pick that up with an electrode that's basically monitoring the intention to swim in his tail. So with this setup, this combined setup, you can be monitoring neural activity and kind of watching this guy look at a stimulus and then respond. So you're really seeing sort of everything from input to output. Um, so let me show you a movie of what that looks like. Uh, this is sped up a little bit compared to real time. 
I'm going to walk you through it. In the upper left is the pattern that the fish is looking at. So every 10 seconds, it starts to move, and then it goes stationary again. And what we're seeing here in the bright colors is an indicator of neural activity. So this fish has been genetically engineered so that its neurons uh, uh, literally light up when they're active. And we're looking at a maximum intensity projection through depth. So it's a three-dimensional volume that we've collapsed into 2D. Um, and the patterns of, of flashing light basically indicate patterns of neural activity. Uh, here in this dot is an indication of the animal trying to swim. So what you can see happening here is that basically this thing turns on. When it's on, he tries to swim, something called the optimotor response. And we see patterns of activity across the brain um, that are rich and have a lot of complicated dynamics. Um, there are parts that are sort of straightforward, like this area always seems to turn on when he swims. And then there are other parts, like the forebrain over here, where we basically have no idea what it's doing. It seems to be kind of randomly, spontaneously active. Um, so this is one example, I think, of a really cool thing that, that we can do in neuroscience now. Um, there are other systems in which we can make similar recordings, um, not at the level of the entire brain, um, but while animals perform really rich and kind of interesting behaviors. So this is work with a, another collaborator, uh, Nicholas Sofrenio and Carl Sabota. Um, and uh, this is work in the mouse. So the mouse's brain is not transparent, as I think should be obvious. And unfortunately, it probably won't be for at least some amount of time. Um, sort of a non-trivial problem to make him clear. Uh, uh, but we are able to monitor neural activity over small regions of the brain um, using uh, what's called two-photon laser scanning microscopy. And you can do that while animals perform really cool behaviors. So this is a behavior that Nick developed where uh, the mouse is running on a ball, as shown here. And there are these two walls on either side of him. And the walls move back and forth uh, to basically simulate his experience of running through a corridor. So mice are very kind of tactile animals. They use their whiskers. So when his whiskers touch these walls, he thinks that he's running through a corridor. And by looping the movement of the walls to the movement of him running on the ball, you can sort of fool him. It's like a virtual reality into thinking that he's running through this virtual environment. So while he's doing that, um, and this is a great behavior. They, they seem to do this very kind of readily. You drop them on the ball, they just start running, and they track the wall. Um, and while we're doing that, you can monitor neural activity, uh, again, not over the entire brain, but over fairly, a fairly large region. So this is about maybe 250 or 400 neurons in an area of the brain called the somatosensory cortex, which is responsible for encoding stuff related to the whiskers, basically. And we can watch patterns of activity while he's doing this complicated behavior and start to figure out how is he sort of representing the world around him? How is he figuring out where to go? How is he sort of remembering where he is? How is he remembering where to go? So those are the kinds of questions that, that we're really fascinated by. Um, the last thing that's really exciting right now is that uh, there are a lot of way, new ways of monitoring anatomy. So the brain is not the sort of network of nodes. Um, it is sort of, but it's actually really rich and complicated in terms of the detailed uh, morphology of individual neurons. A neuron is not the sort of thing that's either on or off. Um, they have lots of complicated structure, complicated patterns of connectivity, complicated forms of chemical signaling, and a lot of new technologies. Um, this is just one example of something developed by uh, a group here at Stanford uh, uh, are providing new ways of anatomically characterizing the structure of neurons and their morphology and their connectivity. Um, and this is going to be another really exciting uh, piece of data and exciting uh, source of information for how, how the brain works. So all this stuff is happening. Uh, and it's giving us all kinds of really cool ways of monitoring the nervous system. But like a lot of, uh, a lot of places um, and problems, we need to now start coming up with kind of productive and uh, sort of interesting ways of working with the data sets that we're generating. Um, so there's sort of two related issues. Um, in many ways, I think the way we need to work with neuroscience data is like a lot of other domains. Uh, the data is large just purely in the sense that when we do, for example, these imaging experiments, we're generating tons of images very quickly. In some cases, it's on the order of about like two terabytes per experiment. We're doing these experiments every day. So it just sort of builds up. And if you're trying to do anything really with those data with MATLAB on your single machine, which is what a lot of neuroscientists do, uh, that becomes problematic. Um, so that's sort of, sort of be obvious. Um, but I also want to stress, it's also the complexity of the data. So when you are recording or you have the time series of every neuron across the brain of an animal, uh, that's a pretty complicated thing to work with. There's a lot of structure. There's dynamics. How do the neural responses relate to things like where he's running, uh, what his environment is? Um, so you need to find ways of putting all of that together. So the sort of general architecture for a lot of what we need to do is that we start with raw data, which tends to be pretty large. 
And then we do something usually that tries to extract out signals of interest. Um, you know, for example, try to find the response associated with all of the individual neurons um, or other kinds of, uh, you know, sort of reductions uh, down to something a little simpler. Um, and then we do analytics to try to figure out uh, what are these patterns that we're looking at? What are the sort of assemblies of neurons that have, you know, coordinated responses? What is their temporal structure? What is the spatial organization of those responses? Um, and we need to, when we have those outputs, Visualize, visualize them, we need to share them. Uh, we need to do this in a collaborative way so that we can sort of coordinate with one another. Um, and sort of the cool thing, why one thing I love about the analytical challenges of neuroscience data is that we kind of have no idea how to do a lot of this stuff. When you have a data set and you are just starting out with it, uh, it's really unclear even what to look for. And the ways that you solve each of these different problems often inform one another. So by doing some analysis, we might realize that actually the way we're processing the raw data needs to change because we weren't sort of extracting the signal that we need to. So the process is constantly evolving, and we're constantly sort of figuring out new ways of solving these problems and handling these data sets. So in thinking about what we needed, uh, you know, when I started uh, basically at Genalia, uh, working with uh, some groups collecting these kinds of data, who, you know, again, were basically sort of used to uh, using MATLAB on single machines, because that's sort of what uh, tends to be the case uh, in academic neuroscience. Uh, we started looking for new things to do. Um, there were really three core uh, principles that we felt were important for working with these kinds of data. Um, the first is speed, because things needed to be fast. But in some ways, more importantly, we needed flexibility. Again, we never really know ahead of time the kinds of things we're going to want to do with the data, and we need to be kind of dynamic and change the way we're, we're working with it. Um, and ideally, that should be interactive in the sense that I want to be looking at data and then changing what I'm doing with it. Um, so for all these reasons, we very early on uh, were pretty excited about the Spark platform uh, uh, as a tool for working with these kinds of data. Um, and this was back, maybe it was like two years ago, so Spark was still kind of in its early days. Um, and it definitely, like, not everything worked perfectly, but it was pretty fun to start using it. And I kind of loved it because it came out of a research group, so it sort of felt like a, in some ways, like a research project. Um, so that was really fun. And basically, we started using Spark to process these kinds of data and have found that so far to be really, uh, really successful and useful for working with um, a lot of the kinds of data that I just showed you. Now, Spark itself, uh, for people, hopefully maybe some people here are familiar with it, um, is not certainly like designed to work with neuroscience data. Uh, it is a sort of analytics platform um, and a platform for working with large, uh, large distributed data sets. Um, it provides a set of really nice abstractions. So what uh, we started doing was coming up with libraries that we could build on top of Spark uh, for working with the particular kinds of data sets that we were generating. So the thing in common to all of the data that we deal with in neuroscience is that it's basically either images or time series. So when we collect these movies of brain activity, these are basically just giant uh, sequences of images that we can work with as distributed collections of images. Uh, and we also work with time series. So we have, say, the time series of every neuron or even the time series of every pixel. So what we did was build a library, which we call Thunder, that allows us to load different kinds of uh, neural data sets, different kinds of images and time series. It's certainly not restricted to neuroscience data, but that's just what we use it for. Um, and then provides a set of internal uh, standardized representations of these kinds of data as well as tools uh, and a whole library built for ways of manipulating these data sets as well as analyzing them. Um, so this was a sort of tool that we started building and have now uh, grown out over the last couple years for sort of using Spark to work specifically with these kinds of data. A little more recently, we also wanted to attack the challenge of how, uh, how to visualize these kinds of data because uh, when you're working with, for example, images and time series and networks, um, we needed sort of rich visualizations and things that would sort of integrate well with the kinds of distributed analytics we were doing um, but still give us a rich picture of the data. Um, so we also started working on a library called Lightning, um, which I'll talk about, which is for the purpose of visualization and is not uh, sort of specific to Spark but is nicely integrated with the sort of overall package. Um, so to tell you a little bit about um, sort of the ways that we attack, attack these problems, the uh, overall structure, again, of most of our data is that basically it's either images or time series. So again, if you have a movie of neural activity, many images over time, uh, that's a bunch of images, um, or you have some giant collection of time series, and you often don't necessarily want to be wedded to one or the other representation. So what we uh, came up with was a set of abstractions um, for working with either images or time series, and both of these are distributed collections, essentially distributed collections of arrays, and we can represent them. We uh, have efficient uh, procedures for basically moving back and forth between these two representations. Um, and these are the two primitive 
uh, data objects that we work with. And then on top of these, we can start building sort of sub, essentially subclasses uh, that provide new forms of functionality. So if you have specifically time series or maybe event series, um, or if you have images, you might want to represent those in terms of smaller subregions of an image like blocks. And on top of all of these, there are a whole bunch of different analyses that we like to do. Um, and these sort of generally fall in the category, I guess, of generic machine learning, but sometimes it's often quite specific to the kinds of problems we're solving. Um, a lot of sort of time series related uh, uh, regression problems, for example, or factorizations of time series. We become pretty interested in tensor decompositions. Um, and in terms of image processing, you have lots of sort of filtering and segmentation uh, and registration. These are lots of problems to be solved with images. So really, this whole library is built around uh, the capability to do those kinds of operations on these kinds of data. Um, so just to give you uh, a couple kind of examples of the kinds of things that, that you can find or that we are looking for um, in these brains when we do these experiments. Um, so this is an example of an experiment where we're trying to figure out across the zebrafish brain uh, which neurons are involved in the representation of a sensory input and which neurons are involved in the output or the behavior and which neurons are involved in both. So one of the ways we can, we can suss those two things apart, and this is really the experimental design side of, of what we do, is you can imagine showing the animal a pattern, like the one we were showing, I was showing you in that video at the beginning, and if you show that over and over again, and you make it kind of weak, so it's a little bit hard to see, what happens is the fish basically only responds sometimes. So he sees the same thing over and over again, but sometimes he, re he responds and he moves or swims, and sometimes he doesn't. So now you can dissociate which neurons appear to be involved in just the representation of the input, because they're gonna respond every time, and which neurons are involved in the behavioral output. So which neurons are actually encoding the fact that the thing he saw became a behavioral output, and are there neurons that are sort of sitting somewhere in the middle? Um, so that's actually what this, this representation shows. So every dot here is an identified neuron, and this color map here ranges from green, which represents things that are sort of purely involved in that behavioral output, uh, red, which represents sort of pure responses to that input, and then yellow is something in between. So one thing that's kind of cool that comes from this is uh, that there are plenty of parts of the brain, uh, like here and here, where things fall out as being very red. Uh, these are optic areas, uh, op the optic tectum of the zebrafish, so this encodes sensory information, so it kind of makes sense. There are areas that are very green. Uh, and then there are a couple regions sort of in the middle of the brain that turn out to be yellow. So that's kind of cool, because it suggests that somewhere between him looking at this pattern and actually moving, there is maybe a sort of small subpopulation of neurons that seem to be responsible for that transition from a sensory input to a behavioral output. So this is, you know, not definitely nowhere close to cognition, but at some fundamental level, a lot of what we do is basically respond behaviorally to things that we see or things that we hear or things that we experience. So in this kind of simplified setting where you really can measure, literally measure the whole thing, um, it can be a cool way to start investigating what is that, what is that process, what does that transformation actually look like. Um, and then we can do uh, related analyses to start to look at coupling, and we're really just starting to develop um, the right approaches for doing this. This is where you now want to say, not just what is each individual neuron doing, but what are the relationships between neural populations? What is the sort of structure uh, of uh, not you know, necessarily connectivity, because you're not measuring it anatomically, but is there sort of functional organization? Can you suss out which neurons are talking to other neurons? Um, and for this, you end up with problems that show up all over the place where you have to sort of uncover the structure of a network by looking at large collections of time series. Yeah, question? Yeah, so there's a sort of family of methods that try to look at, you know, fit models that, for example, model the response of one of these guys as a function of the response of a bunch of others across time. And by recovering the sort of filter that, that couples those two, you can start to suss out maybe how they're related to each other. Um, this is a sort of ongoing field. Many people here probably have experience with this kind of, kind of modeling, and there's lots of ways to do it. Um, and we're sort of constantly evaluating and sort of revising the way we think about it. Um, one big problem with these, these methods in general um, is that when you have an animal that's actually like behaving, there are these behavioral events that are really strong signals, and sort of the whole brain becomes correlated because it's sort of all involved in this one event, like swimming. Um, and just as a sort of analytic problem, like how do you fit models to large collections of time series and sort of get rid of the influence of these common inputs? That's just kind of an interesting machine learning problem that I think as yet is not, not exactly solved. Um, so that's a big part of our work is like thinking about how do you recover 
the right signals from these kinds of from these kinds of data. Um, we also do uh, do analyses that are a little bit more abstract, um, but are sort of provide a very different way of looking at the structure of neural representation. So I'm actually showing here uh, in this video a, a representation of activity across the brain. Uh, this is again the zebrafish. In this experiment, he was looking at patterns that were moving in different directions. And we've done uh, a dimensionality reduction. It's basically a variant of PCA, um, but with a little bit of tricks. Um, and the idea is you take this giant collection of time series, and you're going to reduce it down into a three-dimensional space where each of these lines represents activity across the brain as it evolves over the course of a single presentation of a stimulus. And the different uh, colors are different directions of motion that were presented to the fish. So you're looking at a sort of low dimensional embedding of the dynamics of neural activity uh, during the presentation of a stimulus. And there's sort of a period in which the responses ramp up and evolve to this area. And then they sort of wander around a little bit. Um, and this is actually where he's doing his behavior, where he's swimming. And then they all come back towards the origin. So this is a way to visualize sort of network dynamics. It's a combination of an analysis and visualization that can be one way, sort of a useful way to get insight into the dynamics of activity. So this is the kind of uh, sort of family of approaches that we're building. Um, and I've talked a lot about uh, the analytics and the kinds of analyses we do. But I want to now shift a little bit and talk uh, and say something about the kinds of visualizations that we're trying to develop. So a big part of, uh, of this whole effort for us is has become visualization because uh, if you're doing complicated anal analyses but you don't sort of find the right way to look at it, uh, it can be a huge, huge problem for insight uh, as well as you want to find ways of sharing and sort of collaboratively exploring, exploring data. So we started this project Lightning that I'm going to describe um, and do a little bit of a, a demo of. And I want to highlight uh, one key person uh, in, in this, Matt Conlin, uh, who's an extremely talented developer who, who has done a lot of this um, um, with me. And it's been awesome working with him. He's based at Rhizome in New York, but he sort of works with us part time, um, as well as a number of other cool part time projects. So when Matt and I uh, started talking and started thinking about the kinds of uh, sort of things we wanted from, uh, to do with visualization, uh, especially for, for neuroscientific uh, data and scientific data in general, there were a few things that became pretty clear as we were sort of evaluating alternatives and playing around with different tools. Um, the first is that we wanted to emphasize sharing and reproducibility. So we want to make visualizations that we can share with each other uh, and sort of reproduce. <laughs> uh, it sort of speaks for itself. Um, we decided pretty early on that it was useful to have a concept of separation between the analyses we're doing and the visualizations. Um, and to not have them necessarily wetted. So I think this is an interesting sort of topic in visualizations, like how close do you have your, your analysis and your visualization. There are a lot of libraries that sort of do them both at once. I think that's really cool. Uh, for a lot of the stuff we were doing, it's felt useful to have some separation between them. And I'll sort of show you what that looks like. Um, we wanted to deal with some problems like being able to load data dynamically. So we're going to do everything in the browser, um, but we don't necessarily want to have uh, the data sets that we're trying to look at all loaded instantaneously, immediately, um, because that basically overwhelms uh, most environments in which you're going to be doing visualization. So we had to have some way of handling that. Um, and then finally, we wanted to really focus on interactivity. So although I'll show you examples of some sort of simple things like scatter plots, uh, what I'm really interested in, the reason we built this, is because we want to think about new ways of interacting with uh, sort of complicated visualizations, the kinds of things that show up a lot for our data, like images and networks uh, and time series, and really think through for these visualizations what are like new ways we can sort of come up with together um, for visualizing these things. I think it's a very exciting, uh, exciting topic. And the web uh, doing things in the browser just gives uh, there's so much opportunity to do things in a kind of new way. So the overall uh, architecture of, of Lightning, which is this thing we built, um, it's a node server, and that's depicted here in the middle. And uh, this node server is, uh, it does a couple things. It's serving up a, a notebook, which we use as a very light way just to sort of manage visualizations and manage sessions. Um, it can run either Postgres or it can just use SQLite. Um, it renders visualizations using a variety of different JavaScript libraries. So we've basically integrated things like D3 and 3JS uh, and Leaflet for doing kind of map, mappy things. Um, and it brings all of those together. And then on the other side, the client, and we have a client in uh, Python, we have a client in Node, um, and a very work in progress client in Scala. Uh, it is fully functional. Uh, so that's cool. I really like Scala. Um, and the client sends data to the server. It's a, a RESTful API through HTTP posts. And then the server renders visualizations. And I'm going to walk you through what exactly that looks like. Um, but this architecture to us gave a nice way of, again, sort of separating the visualization from um, the analysis, but still providing a lot of flexibility in terms of 
lots of different kinds of visualizations that we can render, and we also have ways of going backwards, so I'll show you a couple examples of that uh, as well. Um, thus far, we've implemented a pretty wide variety of visualizations. We're constantly thinking about, uh, thinking about new ones. I, I'll, I'll say this at the end, but everything, uh, all, all of Lightning as well as the other projects I was talking about are all open source, so we're excited to have people, people are interested in contributing or sort of thinking about new ways, uh, new ways of using these visualization tools. Um, so let me hop into a demo. Are there any questions? Yeah. Oh, interesting. How do they sort of process uh, sort of visual? Interesting. Um, so there, there are neurons in uh, parts of the uh, zebrafish brain that definitely uh, sort of, for example, respond to some directions more than others. So in some sense, it's a spatial decomposition. That's a, that's a decomposition in the Fourier domain, uh, but in the sort of direction, uh, uh, the two-dimensional Fourier transform, right? So it is sort of representing motion, but only some directions of motion. Um, so there are definitely neurons that do that. Um, and, you know, for example, we can measure across the brain the degree to which different neurons are encoding different directions of motion. Um, and uh, in that sense, it's similar. Um, I actually did uh, previous work uh, studying the visual system of the primate. Um, the sort of way in which neurons in the primate brain encode visual information is a little bit different. Um, they have uh, receptive fields that are sort of more localized in space, um, I believe. So there's sort of similarities and differences. Yeah. Uh, the mouse also has a, a visual cortex that it and its ner visual neurons are actually quite similar to those in the primate. They're just really, really big. So the region of space that they encode is really, really big because mice have really poor, uh, poor spatial vision, basically. Mice are really good with their whiskers. It's kind of remarkable. Um, but vision is not really, but they like live underground and they just run around sort of the burrow and they don't really see that well. Um, so it kind of makes sense. A lot of people study mouse vision. Uh, I think it's a, it's a hard, system because you're sort of using, you want to use the sense of the animal that that animal uses the most, uh, just sort of as a rule, rule of thumb. Cat Excuse me? Cat vision. cat vision's great. Yeah, no, some fundamental, fundamental discoveries in visual neuroscience were made in the cat um, in the, back in the 70s. Um, cats are not really studied so much that frequently in neuroscience anymore. I think, maybe, just to work with. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I had some cats, yeah, I believe that. I think also the more people take them as pets, it makes people uncomfortable. Um, I don't do any work with, with uh, cats. But now let me shift over to do, to do a couple demos. Um, and just sort of, yeah, show you, show you how all this stuff works. Um, all right, great. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little bit of a tour um, of, of what Lightning looks like. And I've got a terminal open here, and I've got a, uh, a Lightning server running here. So it's just running on my local host. Um, you can run it locally, or you can run it on, a, uh, on some external server. Um, we have a very simple uh, deployment to Heroku. Um, so that's basically one button. I'll show you an example of a Heroku uh, server running. But we often just use it locally. Uh, and we're working on a, like a Mac OS X app that will just start it up on your local machine immediately. Uh, we think that'll be kind of nice. So it's running here, and what I have on the left is a Python terminal, and I'm just gonna be showing you the Python client, which we're gonna use to interact with and generate visualizations uh, in Lightning. So the first thing we do is uh, just instantiate our Lightning object, and uh, the default host is localhost, but you can set that to be whatever you want. Um, can everyone see down here? Maybe not. Fix that. There we go. Um, okay, so now I'm going to create a session, and we'll call it Yelp Meetup. That's where we are. And then I'm going to go to my session. So this thing, uh, this sort of interface to the notebook, is really just a way to, uh, kind of lightweight way to look at the different sessions that you're running. Um, it, it shows your visualizations, and we'll see in a second. It's a little bit of a notebook that is not a sort of full-blown notebook with code and everything else, but it's just a sort of visualization notebook, um, which is a useful way to, to see your visualizations and keep track of them. Um, so we're going to click on Yelp Notebook, the one we just created, and uh, now I'm just going to make some dummy data using scikit-learn, uh, the make blobs. I don't know why they're called blobs. Um, this is generating data from a, a sort of clustering model, like a k-means clustering model. Um, so now we're just going to do viz equals 
lightning dot uh, scatter, all right, with our two, uh, two x and y values. And we have a visualization on the right. Um, let's actually give it a slight little more contrast by just setting the label equal zero. All right, it's nice and purple. Um, so this here is an interactive, uh, interactive visualization. You can move around. Um, we have this uh, two axis zoom in. So I'm controlling, I just like that. I like the way it feels. Um, uh, this is, of course, a scatter plot. So I think the, the, the degrees and the forms of interactivity are a little bit limited compared to some things I'll show you before. But for all of the visualizations we've tried to think about, like what is the nicest way to interact with it? What are kind of interesting, maybe different ways to interact with it? Um, so now why don't we uh, quickly train a model? So I'm going to do it using Spark just because we do a lot of stuff with Spark. Um, this is just uh, Spark's k-means. Um, but of course, you could do this using any of your favorite k-means training. And we're going to assign a label to each of these points. So clearly, looking at the graph, it looks like they come from different labels. And now we can actually just update the visualization with the labels that we just learned, like that. So it's just modifying and uh, just using actually D3 animations to update it um, over in the browser. And we can go to the other, other set of labels that we had and see that uh, although, of course, the labels themselves change, because that's what happens when you do clustering, um, the true labeling or the true assignments and the inferred ones match. The world is right. Um, it's very encouraging. Um, so now let's do something different. Um, we're going to make a 3D scatter plot. So when you're doing clustering or any other kind of uh, analysis on multidimensional data, uh, of course, 2D is not, that's not quite enough. I wish we could somehow th see in 20 dimensions, um, but I feel like we're constantly in visualization trying to come up with ways of looking at more. Uh, three uh, instead of two is at least a step in the right direction. Um, so we have 3D visualizations uh, also in the browser, all in the same environment that are now using 3.js. Um, so the first thing was D3, and uh, we added, just because it was fun, uh, these like first person shooter controls uh, on the 3D visualizations. So that's just a fun way to look around. Um, and then again, you can update it. So I just kept track of this object. So I can just do viz dot, actually, sorry, not update, let's append. Uh, we're just going to add a whole bunch of points to this thing and add some more. Um, so in many ways, what this really is doing is it's just giving a very lightweight way to use these different JavaScript libraries to render things in the browser and then interface with them uh, with this really simple, uh, simple client. Um, and this client, this is the Python client. The Scala client is designed to look identically. The Node client looks identical. Um, and these clients are really easy to, to write because the interfacing here uh, is again pretty simple. Um, so there are other visualizations. So we can maybe make a correlation matrix and do lightning dot matrix. Um, so here's a case where, in terms of the interactivity, um, whereas like on a scatter plot, you want to zoom in on it, and this is sort of an obvious point. You don't really want to zoom in on a matrix. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, instead, you want to do things maybe like changing the uh, the sort of scaling, how how uh, where it's going from sort of very gray where you can see a lot of the fine detail to something more high contrast where you can see sort of the extremes. Um, or you might like to do something like change the color map, um, that kind of operation. Um, we can look at an adjacency matrix. Um, so this is basically the same thing, but now we're going to add the label um, and it's going to render it in a way that organizes things by group. Um, label is the group that we uh, got when we did that uh, k-means. Um, and finally, uh, we're going to look at a graph, because that's cool. Um, so this is just kind of an interesting, uh, interesting way to render these kinds of data, where I'm going to use the first two uh, as x and y, the first two dimensions, but I'm going to draw lines between points based on the correlations that we measured. Um, so this actually reveals sort of an interesting uh, property of looking at two-dimensional projections of high-dimensional things. Um, so this is also an interactive thing. I can zoom around on it, um, and I can click to highlight only the things that are connected to each one. So in 2D, these two are really close to each other, but because the lines that are connecting them are based on this sort of higher dimensional feature representation, uh, the degree to which things are actually tight, you know, so this guy's only connected to all of these guys uh, when you're visualizing the network or the relationship in terms of the correlations, but he's actually right next to him in 2D. So this is sort of a, just an interesting property of high dimensional spaces, um, but is, yeah, you can sort of see now this diversity, uh, diversity of visualizations. So uh, this is all using it from within a notebook that I'm running locally. Um, you can do the same thing in a uh, remote uh, Heroku uh, server, for example. Um, I don't know how Heroku comes up with their names, but I really like them. 
So it, this is Rocky Atoll. Uh, I had to look this up. An atoll is like a cliff with grass and stuff on it. Um, and back in the client, I can uh, just set the host to be Rocky Atoll. And then I can do the same thing. Let's create a session. So now, oh, it may be, Heroku like goes to sleep a little bit when you don't ping it often enough. I think that's probably what's happening. Second. Great. All right. So here again is my Yelp meetup. And then I can do lightning.scatter. Um, let's do this one. Um, and then what I did this to show you is that we have uh, a bunch of things you can now do, this, do with this visualization, like uh, share a public permalink. So now you all could go to this location and see the same thing I'm looking at. Um, you can add a little bit of markdown. This is a cool plot. All right. And then everybody can get that. So it's a very easy way uh, to share. And we have lots of sort of ways of uh, you can embed this in some other website. We have iframes and PIMs. Um, and you can also take a screenshot so you can save out a ping file. Um, so it's just an easy way, uh, again, if you're running on a server that is sort of facing the world, um, an easy way to share what you're doing and sort of show people what you're doing. Or you can just share an entire notebook. So you can make a public link to the notebook. Um, now, we don't think of this as a fully featured notebook in the sense that there's, of course, no code here. So uh, everything in Lightning uh, is compatible with the IPython notebook. So you can generate these visualizations um, within an IPython notebook. Um, and we added this little hook. So basically, just by calling lightning.line the way I did before, it'll automatically render. And then you have uh, in the notebook the same kinds of things we were just looking at and be able to interact with them. Um, and on our website, there's a whole bunch of examples. Um, so the last thing uh, in the demos section that I wanted to show uh, was an example of uh, integrating a little bit of the visualization with a little bit of the analysis. Um, and this is done uh, now combining the Thunder library, which is running on top of Spark, with Lightning for the visualization. Um, and I'm showing this example in a Databricks Cloud notebook, uh, which is this uh, thing that Databricks is developing to make really nice managed uh, cluster environments. Um, you can do the same thing in an IPython notebook. Um, but this gives you a cluster, basically, uh, in a really easy to use way. So I already loaded and cached some data. So I'm really just going to show you uh, what it looks like to do a simple visualization of it. Um, this is a, a sort of uh, a time series data set. So I have the time series of a bunch of pixels from the mouse brain. Um, and I have uh, about 9,000 time points. And the dimensions in, in space of the image are 512 by 512. And what I'm going to do here is an operation that just computes the mean across time and now gives me an image that I can, can visualize and look at uh, inside the notebook. So the data is cached, so accessing it and doing that computation is really fast. This is maybe like 50 gigabytes or something. Um, and then I'm going to uh, render it. And I'm going to render it in a visualization that's going to let me uh, sort of browse the, the image or browse the map um, in a way that I can interact with it. Uh, Um, I should point out that, there it is. Um, this is data that is publicly available on uh, Amazon S3. We've been trying to put, put some data sets available so people can play around with these data that are not neuroscientists. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that at the end. Um, so here is a, uh, this map of the mouse brain, or a certain portion of the mouse brain. I can zoom in on it. And what I'm going to do is, uh, one way you might want to interact with these data is to draw some regions around a few of these neurons and then try to say, what does the time series of that individual neuron look like? Um, so we can do that. Uh, I can draw some regions. Not great at freehand drawing. All right. These. Um, it turns out the bright ones are not the good ones, because the bright ones are actually dead. Um, uh, probably. There's some degree of sort of excess, uh, excess fluorescence, um, or excess expression of the indicator um, that causes these to fluoresce. Um, I can change the color because it's a little hard to see white on, uh, on black and white. Um, and then what we can do is now, so I created imviz as the visualization. I can now use the, get the polygons that I just drew on that map and query them back in a Spark operation to extract the time series from those regions. Because what we were looking at here is an image, but it was an image representation of this multidimensional sort of 50 gigabyte thing. So now we're going to grab uh, just through a simple 
uh, basically a reduce by key, we're going to grab the time series associated with those, and then that sort of spoils it because I saw it from when I was doing it before. Um, now we're going to visualize those time series. Um, so that's what's showing here, and this is in this little sort of time series thing. Time series visualization is a really interesting problem. Um, one thing we came up with was this way of being able to kind of flexibly look at which, uh, which of these time series you want to look at at any given time, um, and sort of pan around and zoom around. Um, so this is really the kind of thing we, we want for, for really interacting with these data. There are, as you can imagine, lots of different ways of now starting to say, how are these neurons interacting with each other? How are they representing different parts of, of uh, what this animal is experiencing, for example? Um, and that's the kind of, uh, these are the kind of tools that we're developing in order to do that. So I'm going to close this and go back to the talk. Jump ahead and just say very quickly um, something that we are working on now um, that we're super excited about um, is that we want to basically start doing these kinds of analyses uh, in real time during experiments. So I think it's really powerful to be able to collect these data and then do the kinds of analytics I was describing. But you kind of want to do it during an experiment because you want to make decisions based on what you're seeing in the data. Um, so those decisions include things like actually changing the nature of the experiment on the fly. Um, there's also a lot of new technologies, uh, very uh, sort of developed again over the last five to 10 years, for manipulating neural activity. So you can genetically encode neurons so that when you shine light on them, it either turns them on or turns them off. Uh, we can also shine lasers on them to kill them, uh, doing, using ablation to kill single neurons, targeted single neurons. And I really believe in neuroscience, this is going to be an absolutely fundamental aspect of how we interrogate a system. Um, I think for any system, you don't just want to monitor it, you want to somehow manipulate it, you want to interact with it and sort of see how does it respond when you interact with it. Um, so what we're building are ways of doing these kinds of analyses on the fly during experiments so we can do targeted manipulations. So as one example here, um, and this we're doing in Spark Streaming by building out a set of sort of streaming analyses as well as streaming visualizations. Um, a lot of those have actually made it into Spark Core itself. Um, including things like streaming clustering and streaming regression. Um, here we're doing something very simple where we have the data from the brain and the mouse is doing his thing on the ball. And what we're going to do is an analysis that tries to relate um, for each neuron how the activity of that neuron, actually every pixel, then the neurons kind of pop out, um, how every pixel is related to the position of the walls relative to the animal. So this guy's running around, and the walls are moving, and somehow he's sort of encoding where he is relative to where the walls are. Um, so how does his brain do that? Um, so by doing this kind of analysis on the fly, in this case, the blue represents wall positions that are very close to the animal's face, and the red represents wall positions that are farther away, and we get this map of the representation of this thing in his environment. And now we can start doing experiments where we, for example, uh, I don't know, kill all the blue neurons. So here is this part of his brain that's representing this thing in the world. And if we now manipulate it, how does that change his ability to interact with the world? Uh, how does that affect the other neurons? How does the rest of the population? Is it sort of robust to perturbation? What kinds of computations do you want to do in order to be robust to perturbation? Um, and as one example of what that ablation looks like, this is by Simon Perone, also in Carl Sabota's group, who's uh, developing a fantastic procedure for, in a very targeted way, killing individual neurons. That's what he's doing here. So these pink neurons have been selected for, for death. Um, and he's just moving around with a laser and targeting each one. There's this little burst of, of fluorescence that happens right after they die. The exact mechanisms of why the sort of the uh, focused laser kills them um, are still sort of being worked out. Um, but we know that this can kill neurons in a very selective way. And we've now done experiments where we've asked, you know, what consequence does killing a small subset of neurons have on the rest of the population? Um, and one, one example of one sort of cool recent result is that things can be really nonlinear. So you can, for example, take a network and knock out uh, 20 neurons and basically bring down another 100. So there, and by bring down, I mean basically suppress neurons that were otherwise responsive to an input. So these kinds of, you know, why do networks have that property? Um, I think it's going to be a really fascinating way to start thinking about uh, how complex networks uh, behave to start thinking about how to perturb them. Uh, and then, of course, we want to ask what effect does it have, does that kind of manipulation have on an animal's behavior? Uh, how many neurons do you have to kill before uh, the animal can't behave anymore? Those are the kinds of questions that we are starting to ask. Uh, I just want to, I want to end by saying that I think uh, in, in a number of ways that I've hopefully conveyed, 
uh, there are all these really exciting uh, ways in which neuroscience and, and sort of computation and analytics more generally are interacting. Um, there's, of course, how we interact with the data and how we visualize the data. Uh, but I also think it goes the other way. I think we're learning things about the brain, have the potential to learn things about the brain that really will influence the way we think about intelligence, the way we think about how to make machines and, you know, sort of how to, how to in some sense, make machines more intelligent. Um, and I think you can do a lot by going in either direction. Maybe we should be sort of studying complicated machine learning algorithms a little bit more like the way we study the brain. And maybe by studying the brain and by manipulating the brain, we can learn more about uh, the actual algorithms that are that are being used by this animal. In some ways, that animal, as he's behaving and interacting with his world, he's solving some really complicated problems that we don't know how to solve. Um, so we should figure out how he does it. Um, partly with this interaction in mind, we started this group, uh, Code Neuro, and we did our first event in San Francisco last fall. Uh, Code Neuro is really about bringing together sort of neuroscientists with people doing data science or engineering or visualization or sort of AI. Um, and trying to bring the, these communities together in, 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 in conversation, which we really feel is more and more important. Um, and we do, as a part of this organization, a number of things. So we have events. Um, we did our first in SF last fall. We're doing one in New York in April. Uh, it's probably a little bit of a trip for some of you guys. Um, but we'll be back in SF next fall. And at these events, we try to combine talks from people both in neuroscience and in data science, but also uh, hackathons and sort of collaborative coding projects. Um, we have data sets that we're uh, making available as part of Code Neuro, really for the purpose of collaboratively working on analyses and sort of vetting analyses, benchmarking analyses. Um, and we also are uh, going to be putting together some analysis challenges where we make data available and then instead of, basically, instead of having every neuroscience lab across the country developing their own solution to problems which are not tested, uh, the idea is that we have competitions where we basically try to figure out, all right, this thing that we all do, let's figure out the best way to do it. And then as a community, as a neuroscience community, we can all use the best solution. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're, we're trying to do as part of this group. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely come to New York if you're going to be there in two weeks. But otherwise, uh, yeah, we'll be back in San Francisco in the fall. Um, so with that, yeah, I want to I wanna close. I want to thank you again for, for listening. Um, happy to continue talking over the next chunk of time. Um, everything I described uh, is open source. That's absolutely fundamental to uh, what we do, we think science should be open. Uh, we think the code that we're developing should be open. And we want to make it as available as possible. Um, and you can follow these links to check out more of what we're doing. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Question. Questions? Hello, uh, I'm Curran from Alpine Data Labs. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm curious about the client side architecture. You have D3, uh, 3.js, he's mentioned Canvas, um, and uh, Leaflet. Leaflet. Yeah. So, so how, what's the kind of architecture look like that's common to all these? And like, where does the state live? And how does the state sort of get from the common layer into the technology specific layer? I'm just curious how that looks like. Yeah. Uh, great questions. And at some point, we're probably going to have to have Matt, uh, who, who did a lot of the server architecture, uh, out to talk to you as well. Um, but uh, the basic idea is that the visualizations themselves, oh, actually, let me show you something I didn't show you because it's relevant to this. Um, so one thing I didn't say is that uh, you can browse all the visualizations that are associated with your Lightning server. Um, and for example, we can just go to one here. Um, so each visualization, um, as defined by the server, is basically a chunk of JavaScript that imports the necessary libraries, uh, which are all managed as sort of a central uh, set of dependencies within the Lightning server, um, and then uses the, or sort of calls the appropriate JavaScript to generate and render this visualization. So the code or the JavaScript associated with all different visualizations is, rent, is bundled dynamically. So anytime we change or you add a visualization or update a visualization, like I can change this right now just by, I don't know, changing the line thickness or something. Um, and I could save this and then it would immediately propagate to every visualization of this type uh, on the Lightning server that I'm running right now. Um, so it's here that we essentially handle uh, the dependencies or importing dependencies from either Leaflet or D3 or otherwise. Um, and then for each visualization, there's a, a data specification, which is just simple JSON. Um, and uh, the data is routed to the visualization. And then one has to, in building these visualizations, handle how the logic of your particular library is going to render 
um, the different kinds of data. Does that help at all? Yeah. So when, for example, the input data changes, yeah. does all the JavaScript rerun? The JavaScript does not, no, not when the input data changes. Um, it depends. So in, uh, these, each visualization object has a, uh, has a format data method, an update data method, and append data. So if data is added, um, if new data comes in and replaces the old one, then it goes, it's routed to the update data. And if we add data, it's routed to the append data. So uh, these usually will implement sort of D3-like uh, mechanisms for, for example, binding the new data to the visualization and updating it accordingly. Um, for each visualization type, you have to work out what is the right sequence uh, to update. And of course, that's going to look very different for leaflet than it is for D3, for example. Um, yeah, so we, you know, there, there's a sort of a fairly standard uh, format. Basically, every visualization here has a format method, an update method, an append method, and something that actually initializes the visualization. Beyond that, there's not a lot of standardization of the visualization itself. Um. Just to continue on his questions, any of this architecture or anything available online in open source? All of it. Documentation and everything is online? All of it, yep. All of it. So everything associated with, with Lightning and Thunder, um, you can check out. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's at github.com slash lightningviz. Um, so a little bit of course, so this is the server itself. Um, and all available, uh, the Scala client, the JS client, uh, the Python client, a little Chrome extension, um, and uh, the default visualizations we also maintain as a repo. Um, so this is what, when you start your own Lightning server, you get all of these visualizations. And these are the ones that sort of come bundled with it as like a startup package. Um, but you can import your own, so you can actually import directly from a Git repo. Um, and as, uh, yeah, as people use this, as people develop it, our hope is that we'll come up with cool new additions to this basic set of defaults. So we're certainly doing this. I spend a lot of time just like playing around with new kinds of visualizations that I, I think are interesting. But we are very open to contributions. Um, we've sort of designed this to be as easy as possible for you to use with your own custom visualizations, but also really easy to use um, or, or at least encourage contributions from a community. Uh, you know, if someone here comes up with some cool thing that's not in here yet, we would love that. That would be awesome. So I think really this is meant to be a sort of community effort to come up with new, new visualization types. But yeah, everything is open and on GitHub. Hi, I was just curious if you'd played around a bit with fMRI data. Um, and what are some of the challenges in terms of scale of using this with fMRI scale? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's funny, I actually, uh, I said I used to work in, I've kind of worked in a lot of animals. Um, because I did my PhD working in both the human, um, in which I was doing uh, functional imaging, and the human, and also the monkey, now zebrafish, mouse. Um, so when I was, I was doing some work in human fMRI, um, that was a few years ago, I think things have evolved to some degree, um, in terms of resolution, for example, has gotten higher. Um, I think the challenges are related, but a little bit different, and I think there's a really cool opportunity to use or adapt some of what we're developing for fMRI data, especially on the analytics side. A handful of people have talked to us because they're interested in doing that. I don't know if anyone's sort of actively pushing for it. I think the biggest difference is that whereas uh, we have, for in any one data set from one recording, for example, uh, can be extremely large just because the time resolution is very high and the spatial resolution is extremely high, I think in fMRI data, any one individual experiment might not quite be that big, but you have way more subjects. Because like we don't run that many mice. Any one experiment might be at most, I don't know, 10 mice or so. But people do, especially in like clinical environments, fMRI studies where they have thousands of subjects. So I think the sort of like the dimensions of each data set are a little smaller, but then the number of subjects are bigger. So that's maybe some of the differences. But I think this could all be readily adapted to, uh, to analyze fMRI data. Hi, fascinating talk. Um, so, can you just uh, give uh, some more details on how um, how you manage and organize, you know, massive amounts of data? Uh, you know, what, what you know file formats you use and the techniques to allow, um, you know, rapid processing of, of that data set. Sure. Um, yeah. So, we pretty early on 
tried to come up with some degree of standardization. Um, one thing about neuroscience is that everybody kind of does things differently. So I definitely, uh, I don't think you could like tell all neuroscientists to agree to use the same file format, but we definitely just started using one and now hopefully, actually some, a lot of people are using it just because uh, uh, it works pretty well for these kinds of things. Um, so one thing unique maybe a little bit about the data that we have to manage is that it's somewhat unstructured in the sense that fundamentally all these data are basically, uh, at least in their raw form, sort of binary either images or time series. Um, so that's nice because you don't necessarily need a lot of the overhead of working with kind of complicated columnar formats and, and lots of headers and all kinds of things. Um, so we actually use, uh, for a lot of the data, like the raw uh, images and time series, just a fairly generic flat binary format. Um, we store the data initially as it comes off the microscope. Uh, so one problem is that the data are locally generated. Uh, obviously, at some point, we want them all to be uh, in cloud storage, for example. But we have to start with the microscope, because that's where the brain is. Um, so we either do uh, a lot of management of our data on a network file system at our research institute, or more and more now, we're trying to do everything on Amazon. Um, it's also the easiest way to share data with other people, which is a huge part of what we're pushing for. So basically, we use S4 command to upload uh, large chunks of binary files um, to uh, folders organized on S3. And then uh, one of the things in Thunder is a set of very simple tools for loading those uh, uh, binary files into Spark and, and, and via a custom Hadoop input format that we wrote. So basically, yeah, we had to do that because there is nothing, uh, nothing exactly built in to Hadoop for uh, loading flat binary files. Um, but that's what we wanted, so we wrote a custom format. Uh, and that's what we load in now. Uh, and again, it's very, in some sense, extremely simple at that level. Um, you know, we don't have like users with multiple locations and all that stuff. Not a lot of strings. Um, but yeah, definitely binary like text for dense numerical data is not a good format. Um, maybe for sparse data, which I know is common in a lot of other scenarios. But this sort of dense, you know, dense numerical array data, uh, flat binary is a pretty reasonable solution. Yeah. So if you're CDF one? Mm, a little bit. Tell me more about it. I think, yeah, we looked at HDF5 okay. a lot. Yeah, so they much. actually support that within the latest releases of NetCDF, but we're using that for binary data. It's oh, pretty yeah? efficient. Okay, that's it cool. It reads in fast, goes out fast. Into Hadoop? Um, well, you can run it on a Hadoop cluster. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I looked at it a little bit, um, but uh, we didn't try it, so that's cool. I did find HDF5 uh, was a nightmare to integrate with sort of hadoop -y tools. Yeah, that's why you want the NetCDF front end on it. Right. The other one is uh, there's a binary blob format for Google protobuffers, I believe. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of curious about the, uh, the selection technique you showed. So uh, I'm kind of curious when you're selecting individual neurons there. You're talking about you're compressing 50 gigs of data into that visual. Um, Kind of, kind of correct me if I'm wrong, like, because it's a brain, so it's three dimensional, but I'm sure you're like kind of squashing the Z. So you've got an X and Y, and it looked like you were throwing time away because it was yeah. a snapshot. That's right. So you're basically selecting, you know, in this XY sort of Euclidean thing, these individual neurons, and you had a bunch of data that you were kind of selecting as a result of that. Was there more going on than that? I just want to kind of be a little clearer on it. What do you mean more? Like, so basically, you were just using the spatial positions of these to access you know, some vector of information for each neuron and then you are processing it after the fact, right? Totally, yeah. So you could apply example. this to any sort of two-dimensional visualization. Yes. Awesome. Totally, no, there is literally uh, nothing, uh, you could say nothing neuroscience specific about what I was showing here. Mm -hmm. This could be a map of satellite imagery and this could be a time series of, I don't know, what do people measure? Uh, like some fitness thing maybe or heart rate or something. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I, I really like, and this happens a lot, that, you know, we're developing things for this application, but I think they have uses outside, um, and we make them open and available because we love people trying them and maybe contributing back. Um, so yeah, you could use this for any, basically, spatio-temporal problem, um, you know, especially one where you want to sort of be interfacing with the spatial aspect of it. Um, you know, that said, what I was doing here, oh, oops, um, what I was doing here to collapse across time is sort of the simplest thing possible, um, is just taking the mean. So we do have built in to, to Thunder um, a whole bunch of things that are a little more, again, not quite neuroscience specific, but sort of specific to the kinds of questions we ask. 
So for example, I, should, I could have showed you a map like that one I showed in the streaming case where every pixel is now going to be colored based on how well you can predict that response as a function of the running speed of the animal. So again, there might be, there's probably a generalization of that in other domains as well, but that's then a little bit more, uh, a little bit more specific. Um, with this uh, in particular, do the neuroscientists uh, like the, I guess, the running mean average or what technique you're using here for um, approximating the local field potential compared to using like an electrode or like do they, do they correlate very strongly? You mean using imaging instead yeah. of electrical recording? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I should definitely should have maybe talked a little more about that. So, right, imaging is a, uh, a fantastic way to record from large populations of neurons, um, but one of the limitations um, is that you, the temporal resolution um, of, of the recording is restricted, so typically this is anywhere between one hertz and eight hertz. Um, and also, when you're doing imaging, you're monitoring changes in calcium fluorescence, which is an indirect indicator of neural activity. What you really, be wanted, you really want to measure is voltage. Um, uh, neurons respond extremely quickly and they can spike very fast. Um, and you really want to have high temporal resolution recordings of, of spiking. The limitation of, of uh, recording neurons with electrodes, which is the, the way to record, uh, sort of monitor those fast time scale signals, uh, is just the number that you can record from. So, you know, in the, uh, you'd say the zebrafish brain, there's 100,000 neurons. Um, there's no way to record from all of those, let alone, you know, maybe even at most now with the best techniques in the mouse, for example, you can do multi, what are called multi-electrode recordings, where you record from, say, 100 neurons. But even in a small brain area, you, you know, there are upwards of maybe 10,000 neurons in the mouse. And it's really a, a trade-off between space and time. So imaging, it's a little slower. It's kind of a less faithful representation of neural activity, but you get a lot more of the population and you can really see the sort of complete comprehensive representation Whereas if you're doing electrophysiology, you get a very a small subset, so you're subsampling. Um, whether or not that's important kind of depends on your problem. So we often like to do both. So in these experiments, for example, I can show you a bunch of EFIS uh, recordings that Nick did where he's uh, recording from a small set of maybe 20 neurons during the same behavior, and you see some of the same things and you see some different things. So like anything, you want to use different measurement techniques and try to come up with conclusions that sort of span those different measurements. Uh, can you talk more about the streaming technology, you know, how much data you are transferring, the real-time data transfer between your client and the server? Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of the throughput, it's anywhere from, uh, I don't know, in some of the cases we're pushing now, it's maybe like 400 megabytes a second um, or 500 megabytes a second um, coming from the microscope. So basically, uh, we have a system where uh, we're not yet doing this via like Amazon servers, because we just can't get the data to Amazon fast enough. Um, so we have a cluster running Spark streaming, and the data, uh, again, in a sort of fairly simple binary form, goes straight from the microscope to the cluster. We ingest them into Spark um, using Spark streaming. Um, we do a little bit of reformatting along the way, um, and that's handled through a Python process that's sort of managing the whole thing. So the data go from the, from the microscope to Spark streaming, they're ingested, uh, we do analytics that usually involve sort of stateful computation. So for example, maintaining some quantities, some streaming statistic associated with every pixel, and then every so so many seconds, dump out either to a visualization um, or to disk some representation of that output, uh, the sort of current snapshot of the, uh, of the result of the analysis. Um, so that can be, we're working on something that can basically send uh, the result of the streaming analysis directly to Lightning. So we can be doing a sort of real-time visualization. Um, um, so those are the, yeah, that's the, that's the process. Hi. Uh, coming from data science background, yeah. are you uh, planning to release our library? Or this is only going to be Python? <laughs> say, say again? Ah. R. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I would love to. Um, uh, yeah, so we, there's at least two people, I think, or one person who was an R developer that wanted to write a, R client for Lightning. Um, are you an R user? Do you want to write one? <laughs> <No>? <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, no, we, uh, we would love that. So the, the short answer is we're, we definitely want to make that happen. Uh, I need to figure out if this person who said they would work on it is actually working on it. Um, if not, we'll, so I don't, I barely know, I mean, I've used R a little bit. Um, so uh, I'm not sure I'm the right person to do it. The thing about these clients in these different languages is they're actually quite simple. 
because um, it really just has to manage a little bit of data munging and then uh, movement of the data. The one thing we want to add to the Python client is handling of Pandas data frames sort of natively. So you can just immediately visualize uh, or have some visualization of a data frame. Uh, and then you'd want to do something similar in R. Yeah. So there, again, yeah. So there's sort of the server itself. Um, if you click on any one of these, um, there's a very simple uh, JSON representation. That's not a particularly easy way to see it. There's a very simple JSON representation um, of the, oh, there's a neuron. Uh, a very simple JSON representation, and all the client does is basically take the data and package it into that the appropriate JSON form. Um, so yes, our client coming soon. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks for the presentation. This is really fascinating. Thank you. Um, how? Question uh, coming from a background far from neuroscience. Um, how do you make sure that? Like, how do you make like all the images be pointing to the same area? Like, do you mean like like how to handle like movement or jitter? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, we have to. One of the one of the things we've built into these processing pipelines is registration. Um, so you know, the sort of ideally the the camera is, is stabilized um, and focused on a particular region, um, but especially in the case of the the animal. So yeah, it was if it wasn't clear. Uh, both for the fish and for the mouse. Uh, in the case of the mouse, it's what's called head fixing. So the animal is basically, uh, he can't really move his head. Um, so the microscope is focused on a particular location. He's not really able to move too much, but he does move a little bit, so there's a little bit of jitter. And right. then one of the things we have to do is basically image registration. So we have to take this long sequence of images and align them so they're all uh, you know, basically in register with one another. And that's a great example of a, uh, something that's really easily distributed and it's something that by doing it with this stuff, what took, I don't know, like eight hours to register one of these data sets now takes like 10, I don't know, 30 seconds or something. Um, so that is a problem that you have to deal with. The fish is paralyzed, so he really doesn't move that much. I see. Um, but a little bit, but that's not really his fault because it's just sort of like the stage that he's on sort of drifts just yeah. a little bit over time. That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that is sort really of, cool. I mean, there's a lot involved in like pre-processing and. Yeah, there, you're solving a lot of problems on the way, like to get to the last part of it. There are a lot of, yeah, a lot of problems. And it's all constantly evolving. So you can sort of, it might not be until the very final rendering of your cool analysis that you realize there's like an artifact in how you're doing the motion registration. And then you have to go all the way back to the beginning. And it's part of why we need these really flexible pipelines, because we're just constantly it's not like something you can just churn the so data through. I'll, I'll hand over the mic, but maybe for later, question on what, what is the next challenge? What is kind of the next thing, career, that is kind of, you know, blocking us from making the next leap? In neuroscience? <laughs> Boy, that's a great question. Um, you can do it for the end. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can say that I think in some ways, although you know, we think a lot about everything I talked about, the sort of analysis, the visualization, what's really important is doing the right experiment. So my group sort of works. We don't do our own, we don't, I don't run an experimental lab. I collaborate with experimentalists very closely. Um, but I, think I do spend a lot of time on the design of experiments. I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we need these tools to process the data efficiently and in a sort of standardized way. But the really important insights will come from designing the right experiments. Um, and just as there's a lot of ways to analyze the data, there's a lot of experiments you can do. If you have a setup where you have a mouse or a fish in this virtual environment with stimuli and walls and all that, there's so many different things you could do. Um, you know, you're going to sort of simulate different environments. How are you going to, what are you going to show the fish? How are you going to get them to behave? Um, so now the problem is not analyzing the data, it's just like picking the right experiment. Um, and that's a different kind of insight that is, is, is hard and takes a lot of, you have to try lots of different things. and, and Sort of see what you're finding. So that's a that honestly, I think at this point is the biggest challenge. We have incredible tools in neuroscience now, um, but we need to think, I think, a little more creatively about the experiments we're doing. But we're trying to do that. When you looked at those uh, micro photographs uh, in time, it, it it was pretty clear to me that there were a whole bunch of circles, mm -hmm. uh, and you then went in and highlighted. Roughly, crudely, some of them. Sure, yeah. Couldn't that be an automatic process? Oh, totally. Yeah. So this that was meant to demonstrate. Uh, great question. 
Uh, it's a good lead-in, actually. So that was meant to demonstrate one way in which you might want to interact with these data. Um, I will say, in this case, yeah, it's a bunch of circles. Um, when you're looking at other kinds of tissue, uh, these might be like complicated dendritics or axonal structures. Um, polygons of some sort. Sure, polygons, yeah. So one of the things that we're doing as part of one of these code neuro data challenges is basically trying to solve that problem. Um, so I should say, this is actually, I think, a great example. Most labs that do this kind of measurement have come up with some solution to that problem. Um, it's usually some code that they wrote in MATLAB that runs kind of not that well on a single machine uh, and is not very scalable and basically impossible for anyone else to use. But like every lab has come up with a solution. And I, I, it's not, I don't want to fault them. Like that's sort of that's the culture in some ways. Um, so one of the things we're doing as part of this Code Neuro group is to try to integrate all of these different algorithms together and sort of figure out like what are the common access patterns, which ones work best, come up with data where we have some kind of hand, you know, hand labeled or manually vetted uh, ground truth, and then figure out which ones really do this job the best. Um, so that will be an open challenge. Anybody here could like submit an algorithm. If you think you know how to solve this problem, that'd be great. <laughs> Hi. Um, so in this complete uh, process of the pipeline from collecting the data to actually visualizing it on the server, mm -hmm. uh, where, I mean, does Lightning handle big data? Like, does it reject or sample in some way? Great question. Um, yeah, so right now, uh, the answer is basically no, uh, with a couple exceptions, but it is something we're thinking really hard about, how to do that, right? Um, so yeah, right now, our general workflow is to sort of extract some smaller something that kind of lives locally on the computer, um, and then that's what you actually try to visualize. Um, there are a few smart forms. So like here, um, when you're rendering these multiple uh, visualizations, it is actually fetching these dynamically. So it's not immediately putting everything you send to the server into the browser all at once. Um, it's stored on the server, and then you can fetch it. So that's one strategy for sort of dealing with medium size data that's like too big to render all at once, but you need to kind of fetch it dynamically. Um, because these are just endpoints in principle, things like the, the so this is just using a leaflet. Uh, this is a leaflet map. It's a map of a single image, but if you wanted to like use Lightning to render a map of tiles, those tiles could be served um, from a Spark cluster, for example. So we've thought about that as a way to maybe have this thing be picking up something that's a lot larger than what we could fit in the okay. sort of on the server all at once. It um, seems like one of the things is that the lightning can expect thunder to do the yes. processing <laughs> or some or whatever you know yeah. scikit-learn okay. or anything um, yeah but it does it's not doing and that was you know we basically to me this is just an, this is an interesting open research problem we explored uh, there's sort of versions of this whole thing where the actually like the lightning server was either doing some spark related things or like trying filtering uh, doing that on the fly. Um, you could imagine running Lightning on the same thing that was running Spark and them working together. I think there's some very interesting things to explore there. But at least so far, we've found that we, this is sort of the way that we found most useful to interact with these kinds of data. But we're constantly thinking about this. Um, I think it's a great, great set of problems. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Jeremy. This is a great talk. So Thank I you. hope you enjoy it as I did. All right, see you next time. And I'll be hanging around if anybody wants to talk about anything. <laughs> <laughs>